don't know what we can talk about in this nation without talking about white superiority, honestly. Who defines the meaning of God also defines the relationship between economy and God. African Americans spent $1.3 trillion last year, making us the 16th wealthiest nation in the world. Why have we not turned those riches into wealth to develop our community? Peace family, peace family. I'm so happy to be here tonight. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sitting down with my man, so I'm extra happy. I, I love me some um, Dr. Rashidi. So uh, before we get started, I'm gonna let everybody know, again, we are having a screening on December 26th. It's the first day of Kwanzaa. So this is a good, like, this is such a good activity to do with the whole entire family because we're gonna kick off Kwanzaa. So just go to our little website, hoppyfilm.com, and uh, get your tickets. And while you're there, you know, we have merchandise. We have some new stuff there, too. So you might want to check all of that out. And and while you are there, make sure that you um, sign up for the newsletter. The newsletter is important because we have three young people that are um, not working on the newsletter with us. Um, and they, they do a really good job with doing the research and, you know, getting those articles in there. So it's really important. And a newsletter consists of like five different things. We have some financial one-on-one -on -one news. We have what's going on with Hoppy, like his screenings, or if we have special performances or something like that. And we also do, um, we have, uh, we, we discuss an economic innovator from the past who's helped black people get to where we are right now. And we also, you know, always talk about health and then we showcase a black business. And and usually it's like a couple of black black businesses that we're doing a newsletter. And also, you know, you guys got to follow us on all our social media platforms. And so and then see all the exciting stuff that we're doing on social media. Every Friday we we are um, showcasing another black business because it's really important that we you know, we believe in cooperative economics. That's what Hoppy is. Um, and before we get started, I just want to say shout out to everyone. I love that our elder is in the house. That's John Henry Staples. And I know the Jefferies are, uh, you know, in Jersey looking at us as well. So peace to you guys. I see um, Aisha. Oh, we have Yoga Girl um, who's on and DM and Sophia. So, you know, it's nice to see you guys. Listen, every single time this man comes in, he drops the knowledge. But this is, when he comes to Hoppy Talks, he's just giving us like a little taste, okay? The real big show is that the one he's gonna do uh, at the end of this week, actually, and he does, uh, it, it's three hours, okay? And the hours, it just fly by like this, but he cuts them up into two one and a half hour segments, however, you always get a little extra and it's like mad pictures and mad information. So it's very important that we, you know, um, support this brother. So I'm going to bring on Dr. Rashidi, Dr. Renoka Rashidi, and he is going to um, let us know what's going on in Australia and in, in the Pacific. How are you doing, Dr. Rashidi? <laughs> I'm good, my sister. I'm well. You can see I've got on my little heavy jacket now it's starting to get a little chilly and i guess you guys are getting ready for Snow. a major storm back there wow yeah yeah i right now I have a heater on me <laughs> it's, cold. it's cold i have a whole house it's drama yeah so I have a well, right now right now it's bright and sunny not a cloud in the sky about 70 oh that's nice. 70, 70 degrees isn't that something but we're oh, going <laughs> We're going to the land down under tonight, and yes. we're gonna visit the islands of the Pacific too. It'll be what we might call the furthest extensions of the ancient Af African world. You know, for a long time, black people were the only people on the planet, and we covered all of these areas. And so it's been delightful. I'm with you and the African diaspora that a lot of us don't look at. The word diaspora just basically means dispersal. And I think that term has Jewish roots. And when we talk about the diaspora, most of the time we're talking about 
Africans in the Americas, North, South, Central America, the Caribbean, maybe Europe. But my African diaspora is the whole world. Yeah, it's we are the original people, and we are the first settlers in all of these places. And Australia and the Pacific Islands is no exception. So I in an honor to be around Leonard and Rosalind Jeffries. When I was younger, I used to do presentations in New York at the First World Alliance. Yeah. And I, re I remember at those presentations, Dr. Ben Ward might show up. Imagine sitting in the audience. and So that meant you were going to be on it. You weren't going to be no punk that night. You were going to rise to the occasion. And people like Dr. Leonard Jeffries and Dr. Rosalind Jeffries, to me, they're like that. They're very, very special, almost legends. And it's just an honor to be associated with them in any way. Yeah, you know, what's funny about the, um, the, the uh, First World Alliance is that I met a sister just by happen chance whose mother was uh, used to keep copious notes, so she used to uh, actually record all of those sessions. Uh, she used to buy a tape at the end. And so when I was in school, I saw everyone's name, I was like, wow, everybody was at the First Alliance. Yeah. yeah you got to listen to some of the old lectures. Well, I mean, going back to, I guess it had to be the 1980s, you know. So anyway, tonight we're going to go to Australia, and this is a, a kind of a trailer for the webinar that I'm going to be doing this weekend, and I appreciate all of your support. Oh, now, I have some oh, photographs. Do you want to start with the photos now, or do you want to talk a little bit and then do photographs? Yeah, we're going to kind of do a little talking, and then you're going to bring in the photographs. Um, all so, right. So let's just start with this. Who are the black people of Australia and the Pacific Islands? Like, who are they? Sis, I don't know if it's on your end or my end, but the internet is not very, very strong. You kind of going in and out. I don't know if it's me or you. But I think you're asking me, who are the black people of Australia and the Pacific? Yeah, yes. Yep. I don't know. God, we have a technical difficulty. Well, <laughs> Yeah, the black people of Australia, we're talking about the people that a lot of us will call Aborigines, which I think they consider a kind of an offensive word. So uh, mm -hmm. Aboriginal is a little bit more politically correct or indigenous. And I think we've all seen images of these sisters and brothers, dark, heavily melanated in many cases. And a lot of times they have straight to wavy hair. Now that's the uh, those are the what we might call, I call, they would have an issue with this, the first settlers. And the reason I say that is this, I've been to Australia, I've been with these sisters and brothers maybe on 10 occasions. And of all the black folk I've met in the world, and I've met a lot of different kind of black people, those are the ones who disavow, I think more than anybody else, the idea that we all come from Africa. They would say just the opposite of that. They would say the Africans come from Australia. They think really? they've all been there and they don't care about any science you, or, or ideology. They don't care about paleontology. They don't care about none of that. They believe almost uniformly with very few exceptions that they have always been in Australia. Now they don't mind identifying with other black folk, but they are mm -hmm. very, very distinct in that sense. And then you have another group of black people, and these are Pacific Islanders, South Pacific Islanders. We're going to talk about them. But this particular group were the victims of enslavement in the 19th century. Just like we were in this part of the world, <clears throat> you had something in the South Pacific called blackbirding. And blackbirding consisted of English pirates kidnapping black folk in the various islands of what we now call Melanesia and taking them to Australia to work in the sugarcane plantations. Okay. So you have a different black population that's been there since like the 19th century. Then you have, you have a bunch of Africans from the continent. Either they're working or students or something like that or diplomats. And then you have a handful of African-Americans over there working 
They tend to be very middle class. They have good paying jobs, et cetera, et cetera. But mostly when I talk about the black presence in Australia, I'm talking about those first people, those Aboriginal people, right? Okay. And in the Pacific Islands, you're talking about three island chains. You're talking about Melanesia, which means the black, literally the black islands. And I've met some of the darkest people I've ever had the pleasure of meeting there. And then you have what is called um, Micronesia or the small islands like uh, Yap and Guam and Palau. Interesting African history there. And then Polynesia or the mini islands, Hawaii, uh, Tonga, Samoa, Tahiti, New Zealand, these vast island chains. Now the first person, and I just want to see that say this, and we could go on and talk about whatever you want to talk about. The first, you know, I, I've done, I do a lot of presentations these days, and I did one a couple of days ago with some um, some Pan Africanists on the continent. Dr. Jeffries was a part of that, and I did one yesterday in radio interview talking about some of the same thing, and it came to me that Melanesia is the only place in the African world that Marcus Garvey or Malcolm X didn't talk about. You know, mm -hmm. Garvey, philosophy and opinions, talked about what he called the millions of Negroes in India. This is in the 1920s. And Malcolm X talked about some of those same people. If there's a, if you can get a book called Malcolm X on Afro-American history, he talks about black people in these parts of the world. But none of those great Pan-Africanists, even Kwame Nkrumah that I'm aware of, talked about black people in the Pacific Islands. The first person that I know of to really talk about that is Dr. Ben, Yosa Benyakana. In the early 1970s, Dr. Ben traveled to New Guinea. And I think he spent a little time in Australia too. I wish I could have spent more time talking to him about that. And he wrote a multi-volume book. I think it's called, They All Look Alike. And this is the first time I'm aware of where an African-centered man talked about the, the Melanesians from an African perspective. So I wanted to acknowledge Dr. Ben in that regard, particularly because the Jeffries are there and I know how close they were. Wow. Okay. Um, you know, I almost had a page of notes already. Well, good. Yeah, every, every time we talk, it's like a page of, it's, it's more than a page of notes. You know, I've never, I didn't realize that there were three sets of islands there. I, oh, yeah. I thought it was, they were just, yeah, okay. So, and can you see them just one more time? So, it's the poly, the, the poly, uh, All right. say it one more the, time. The, <laughs> the Polynesia. The Polynesia? Okay, see, let's start at the beginning. Okay, yes. All right, Melanesia. Melanesia, Melanesia means the black, yeah, literally the black islands. So, if you have a name like Melanie, it basically means little black girl. Okay, so melanin. Melanesia consists of several islands. The biggest one is New Guinea, which I think is the largest island in the world after uh, Greenland. And New Guinea is divided into two parts. One part is colonized by the Indonesians. The Indonesians call it Irian Jaya. And uh, the black folk, the native people there call it West Papua. The Papuans are probably the majority population in uh, New Guinea. And then the eastern half is Papua New Guinea, which has been independent, I think, since 1963. So that's the biggest part. But you have several smaller island nations. You have the Solomon Islands. You have New Caledonia, which is still a French colony. You have Fiji, which is at the border between Melanesia and Polynesia. Okay. You have Vanuatu. And all of these have an interesting history with me personally. I got stranded in Vanuatu when they had the massive, what they call cyclone a few years ago. Oh. I was literally stranded there. I had to be evacuated out. And so I had developed a very interesting relationship with the black people there because those sisters and brothers took care of me. I may have been the only black person in Vanuatu who wasn't from Vanuatu. Most of the tourists there are from Australia and New Zealand. And mm -hmm. when I meet sisters and brothers in these places, I say, treat me like one of you. 
Don't treat me like one of those European tools. And they do that. So all at once, at that time, the fourth largest storm to ever hit land hit Von Watt the day I got there. What? I didn't know what a cyclone was. What a cyclone. I'm saying, I hope my internet connection doesn't get disrupted. It devastated the whole island. And I was stranded there. Nobody knew where I was. You know, I didn't even tell my travel agent. None of my family members know where I was. I was literally stranded there. Those sisters and brothers looked after me like I was a family member. This is Pan-Africanism in practice. So yeah, this is my yeah. life. And then Micronesia, Little Islands. You have, have Guam, which I think is in a can protectorate. You have Saipei. You have one called Yap, interestingly enough, and I call Yap. Mm. You have one called Truk. I had I taught once at the University of Hawaii, and I had a student that looked just like Richard Pryor. And I was I say, brother, where are you from? And he said, from Truk. I said, where is that? He says, in Micro. So I went there. And then you have a beautiful island called Palau. And these are some of the most wonderful people you ever met. To me, as much as, Af as, much as we love Africa, the South Pacific is paradise. Wow, it's paradise. I got to get down there. <laughs> the other side of the Pacific to Hawaii, which seems to have African roots in um, Tahiti, as in Mutiny of the Bounty. <laughs> and then you have... <laughs> Tonga, that's Samoa. Okay. Oh, this internet. Is cool. Okay. Are we having internet issues? You know what? This is yes. I, I, it's like you're stopping sometimes and then you're coming back. I don't know. It could be me. I don't know. You said paradise. Well, I plugged this. I replugged this cable. Maybe that'll help some. You know. Okay. Yeah, it's paradise. Friendly so people, it's, and it's just breathtakingly beautiful. So, you know, so beaches it's, like you've never seen before. Okay. So it's safe to say that if you're if you're black and you go there, you're you're really embraced by the people. That's my experience. Okay. But I'm embraced by that like that in a lot of places. Because, I was about to say, yeah, you're in Disneyland. Well, thank you for that. We better have that conversation another time. But thank you anyway. <laughs> but a lot of it depends on, I think, how you carry yourself. You know, I travel, I've been to 125 countries in 20 years. I travel all the time. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that you do not project the idea that you are somehow better than be. You come from a powerful, the United States, Babylon is powerful. Yeah. And so yeah. you can't take that level of arrogance that sometimes mm -hmm. comes with that because people pick that up. So I tried, you know, to say I'm no worse than anybody and I'm no better than anybody. I'm one of you and I'm here to be with you. Absolutely. And it tends to work out. And the South Pacific is like that. And I can tell you story after story after story where people have really uh, looked out for me. You know what is interesting? that when you're in the South Pacific in particular, I've had this experience also in Fiji. In Fiji, one of the things that's so nice about it is that they say they come from Africa. I've, had, I've been in Fiji a few times. You can just literally walk down the street and people will look at you. They know you're not from Fiji, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. they don't know where you're from exactly. And so a person might aggressively jump up in your face and say, we are from Africa. Where are you from? And if you say you're from Africa, well, you practically have to get a crowbar to get them off of you because you got to fend for life. And then they have the nerve to say, have you been to Africa? And if you say, yes, I've been there. Well, come sit down. Tell us. We want to hear about Africa. It's so refreshing to be around in the diaspora. Well, you don't have to argue with about African identity. They ain't talking about Aboriginal or Ados or, you know, fundamental African, none of that. They see you as a brother or a sister. And I think that's just absolutely wonderful. Wow. So how did you, how did you even become, to, you know, interested in studying this part? You know, I feel like 
because every time, you know, when you start to talk about a certain area, it's like, I'm always curious as to how you even think to even go to this area. So what led you to go to Australia and the Pacific? Like, what were you thinking? Early? Well, I don't know how I first became interested in Australia and the Pacific. I remember the, the one incident that stands out. I was a university student back in the early 70s living in Los Angeles and attending a school called California State University at Northridge. It's about 20 miles away, I didn't drive. So I had to take the bus. And I remember one night taking a bus out to Northridge and there was a Los Angeles Times newspaper there. And it was an article about these Aboriginal Australians. And I brutally, the British treated them, cut them in half, roasted them alive, hunted them for dog food, decapitated them, castrated them, enslaved them, I mean, you name it. I said to myself, who could these black people be that inspired such fear on the part of Europeans? This is around 1972. So I think about then, and then I came under the influence of uh, Kwame Ture, Stokely Carmichael, and he was a great Pan-Africanist talking about this global vision. And then I read, even before Dr. Ben, I think I read an article by a brother named Roosevelt Brown, who was from Bermuda, and they used to to be a publication called Black World, back in the 70s, I guess. And he, he was interviewed about the black presence in Australia and Pacific. And me being the kind of crazy person that I am and wanting to go places where nobody's been before are not too many people I did. You see, I'm a historian, but I've always had a desire to make history and to be a part of history. And, uh, and that's exciting to me. Wow. So you know how uh, India had the most amount of black folks. So how how does like their population in terms of size, um, you know, like how like how in in terms of size, like is it is it a little bit smaller or is it like the same like as America in terms of just size? How does it compare? I would say the uh, black folk in the Pacific Islands are no more than ten million people. At best, and oh, Australia, yeah. probably, Australia is probably less than a million, so there are really not that many of them. Now, here's the question: Since you brought up India, at least I think you did. The question becomes, and I've been studying this for a better part of fifty years, and I still don't have a precise definition. What is an African? And what is a people? Let's say, for example. You have people in Southern Africa called San and Nama, mm -hmm. or so-called Bushmen and Hottentots. These, for the most part, are very light complexion people. They're short. They're really very statuesque, tall, beautiful people. Living right next to them are the, the Hutu and the Batwa populations, most of them less than five feet tall. So what do Africans look like exactly? And if all humanity can be traced to Africa, and I have no doubt that there's one race, and that's the human race, which originated in Africa, who is not an African? Mm. So sometimes people say, Renoko, I resent you putting the label black or African on people in other parts of the world. Like some person uh, asked me the other day, use the expression uh, dark-skinned Indians. I'm always talking about black people in India. And I almost fell out of my seat laughing. I said, these are black people. They're not just dark-skinned Indians. That's like saying, I'm a dark-skinned American. Yeah. I'm an African living in America, but I don't have a precise definition for yeah. what an African yeah. is. And what is a black person? Let me tell you a little story. I was invited to Australia first time in 1996, along with Kwame Ture, to speak at a historic conference, the world's indigenous hey, Who wouldn't want to do that? But Australia was where my heart was and I wanted to go. But the Egyptian people said, if you break this contract, we'll never work with you again. And I needed that, those ducats, to be honest with you. And the sisters and brothers in Australia, <laughs> yeah. The sisters and brothers in Australia said, don't worry about it. We're gonna have another conference two years from now. 
So don't worry, pick anybody you want. This is really a high compliment to me. Pick anybody you want in your place and we'll pay all their expenses. You'll be the keynote speaker at a historic conference of world's indigenous people. So I picked my best friend, a brother named James Brunson. James got back from Australia, I got back me. I called him, I said, James, I think it didn't go well. Well, why not? He says, well, for one thing, we had technical problems, we had technical issues. I said, well, it had to be more than, he says, yeah. He said, these sisters and brothers don't see themselves as African. He says, they're not anti-African, but they ain't having we come from Africa. That bothered me. So I called my guru, John Henry Clark, late at night, Dr. Clark answered the phone personally and said, hey man, what's wrong? I said, Dr. Clark, friend of mine went to Australia, met with the Aboriginal Australians, they say they're not African, what do you think? He says, Renoko, don't worry about it. He said, I can take you down 125th Street in Harlem and show you the blackest person in New York City who'll say, I ain't no African. He said, wait until Africa gets strong and then even you will be surprised at who identifies with Africa. And so I think, it, make a long story short. I love that story, by the way. But to make a long story short, I don't have a precise definition for what an African is. And I don't even have a precise definition for what a black person is. If you do, please tell me right now. I'm going to write it down. I'm going to interview you for the rest of the night. You <laughs> you no, know, I just know I feel African. I, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, I just, I feel it. I, I feel all of it. So Well, now you have white folks in South Africa who were boys in Afrikaners for a long time. Now they say they're African. There was a measure uh, pushed through the parliament of Uganda saying that the Chinese living in Uganda should be considered honorary Africans or an African tribe. So exactly what is an African? And that's a mm. question I would never have a clear answer for. Yep. Yeah. That's why we need more research. We need more out here, pounding the pavement to find this research and find an answer to that. You know, I, right I now I, I'm definitely um, feeling African. So, <laughs> right. um, just um, if, if we can just talk, a, we're gonna. I'm gonna ask you about like one more question, and then I want to see see the pictures, and we're gonna come back to some more questions. Sister, um, you can do anything you want. It's a delight and an honor to be on the show. I'm so grateful oh, to Happy Movement, the Happy Movement and Happy Talks. So oh, anything you are anything you attack you want, all you have to do is say. All right. Oh, let me tell you, we are just so happy you said yes. <laughs> I say that all the time. You know, as much as we love um, you know, I mean, we love, we love when you guys um, come, but we are, you know, like just trying to find, you know, like the right scholars because not everybody can come. And so it's like, when you guys say yes, we're like, yes, yes. And we're so excited. Like we literally are so excited, you know? So I just think about the first time you came and I was like, I was like, oh, I want to do the interview. And I was like, well, can I just pop on and do it? And so I'm so happy I get to sit down with you now and do it. So it's really cool. <laughs> What's your question, my sister? You laid the basis for it. It's got to be a good one. What it is? Well, you know what? Just religious and spiritual systems. Like, what are they into? Uh, mm. Did I say already that the uh, Aboriginal Australians are the most spiritual people I've ever encountered? Did I say that? No, you didn't. Oh, I, hey. I've been in India. I've been with the Batwa, the Sun, all kind of black folk. But I tell you, that the indigenous people of Australia are by far the most spiritual people I've ever encountered. In fact, there's something about Australia itself. I think that there are certain, I could be wrong, but I think that there are certain places in the world that exude more spiritual energy than others or different kinds of spiritual energies. It's hard for me to believe that those pyramids on the Giza Plateau and Kemet were just built there at random. Mm -hmm. Australia exudes a strong spiritual energy. You can, I've seen it many times, you can be driving somewhere or be out somewhere in the country and you can see a rock that looks like a human or a tree that you would swear looks like a human being that you know, but there's something about it. And I've been with sisters and brothers out in the bush and I've just learned many, many, many things from them. For example, Aboriginal Australians refer to the earth as mother. 
whenever possible, they go barefoot. They want it and then they lay on the ground and sleep on the ground. Mm -hmm. Want to be closely connected with mother. Um, one of my early tours there, I took a group and we had just gotten back from Egypt. And we were in Australia then. And one of my brothers, a brother named Brother Anuni, who the Jeffreys would know, good brother. I miss him a lot. He became an ancestor a couple of years ago. Mm. We just got back from Egypt. And Anuni asked this indigenous brother, he says, look, you guys claim you've been here for 60,000 years. We just left a country not that old and they have these magnificent monuments and cities. Why don't you have cities and monuments and temples like that in Australia since you've been here so long? And the elder said, um, we think of the earth as our mother. Why will we build a city on top of our mother? They have a way of looking at things that seems to make perfect sense. Um, they have what is called men's business and women's business. That you can only talk about certain things among the men and certain things among the women. And if you cross that line, you can be killed for that. What? One night I was talking to a group of brothers there <laughs> And they, in general, they drink a lot because they've been so oppressed. Okay, I was going to say that. Alcohol abuse is very, very prominent among them. They drink a lot and they smoke a lot of cigarettes, smoke a lot of ganja. They just smoke a lot. So one night I'm hanging out with these brothers and I'm doing as they do. <laughs> and we're talking about men's business. And the, 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 the I mean, you can cut the smoke in the room with a knife and there's empty bottles and stuff and we're kicking it around. And, it's, and they liked me. And they said, Brother Renoka, we talked to you about anything. I said, well, I want to hear everything. And we somehow, the subject of, here's what they believe. They believe that animals take human form. Okay. Mm. And somebody had asked me about that before my first trip. So I'm talking to these and they would say, yeah, of course, you didn't know that. Like, what, we thought you were intelligent. What kind of imbecile are you? Of course, animals take human form. And he says, in fact, some of our most distinguished elders are able to leave the body. They're able to astral travel. I said, well, how did they do that? They said, well, there's a certain circumcision uh, ceremony you must take. And they, <laughs> they cut the head of your penis in half. I said, I don't even want to hear any more about it. Leave the body, leave me alone. But they are really, really, really deep. I'm telling you, sister, it's just, I could write a book about my experiences with the indigenous people of Australia. Utterly fascinating, been there for a long time. Some of them told me that they saw the white man coming, that they knew that they were coming, that I've been in caves in Northern Queensland in Australia where a brother took me and says, I go and talk to my ancestors here. And he showed me paintings on the walls of this cave that are thousands of years old that according to him showed the presence of the white man. Oh, they're very, very deep. A lot of them believe, not only do they not come from Africa, but that they come from the Milky Way. Mm. Here's another story, quick story. One time I was hanging out with a group of them and they told me how they go fishing. And I said, okay, tell me, tell me, tell me. I said, what we do is we're in the bush now. What we do is before we go fishing, first of all, we pray. And then we get a basket and some non-toxic substance and we go to the, the pond, the fishing hole, and they dam it up so there's no fresh water going into this, into this pool. And then they put the non-toxic substance in there, which literally makes the fish drunk. It gets the fish high and the fish float to the top. And they pick the big ones and leave the little ones alone and put it in their basket and then they undamage so fresh water will flow through there. And then they go home and pray and eat the fish. They don't waste anything. So you could be driving down a road and see a dead animal that's been run over by a car. They will stop, <laughs> put that animal in the car, and that's dinner for that night. You can't be talking about, I'm a vegan or a vegetarian, or I, I don't eat that. They ain't having that. I've hung out with them and eaten roasted kangaroo tail. I've been on their reservations. Oh, yeah, sister. It makes me want to go back I'm very blessed to have had those experiences because I try not to come in a situation like that as a tourist. Yeah. I love five star hotels. If I could stay in a 10 star hotel, I would do it. But it, sometimes it's so important just to be with the people. 
Absolutely. And to live with them and about them and say, you are a part of me, you know, and I'm a part of you. I could go do the whole night's program about stories in Australia. You should have never got me started. I know, you know, somebody um, uh, trying to be found out is you know, attached. She's like, I love to hear the stories. But you know what? Um, and Julian said this too, um, because I was thinking the same thing when you were talking about this. What? So you said it sounds, sounds to me like the Dogon tribe. Is there any type of uh, comparison to, you know, to what how they practice spirituality versus how they uh, practice spirituality on the continent? of Africa? I would think they would really relate to the Dogon. You know who they really relate to are Native Americans. Mm -hmm. They seem to know there's a real close bond. Even yeah. at the conference that I spoke at, there were a bunch of Native Americans there. And they also they have, they have something else in common. In Australia, the sisters and brothers there were the victims of what is called the stolen generations. They say generation, but it's really generations where their children were taken away and raised in kind of foster homes like slaves and taught, taught to despise their indigenous roots. And everybody in Australia, all the indigenous people were, infect, were affected by it at some point. I didn't realize until much later that the Native Americans had a very, very similar experience that a lot of their children were taken away. So they really relate to Native Americans even more than the people on the continent. And they don't have a close relationship with the Pacific Islanders. In fact, they tend to, speaking generally, resent the um, Pacific Islanders who were brought there as a result of enslavement. You know, th there's a, a strong division. Again, you have the indigenous Australians, you have the Pacific Islanders, you have the people from the continent of Africa itself, and then you have African-Americans over there. So you have these four distinct groups of black people. And the Aboriginal Australians seem to resent the others because I think that they feel like they have been given preferential treatment that the indigenous people have been denied. Let me just say this. It wasn't until January 1967, I want to repeat, it wasn't until January 1967 that black people, that indigenous people in Australia were considered human. Mm. In January 1967, there was a national referendum. And for the first time since 1788, when the British came and established it as a prison settlement colony, that the indigenous people were regarded as human. Up to that point, they were classified officially as flora and fauna. You, did you hear me? 1967. 1967. And so there's a level, I think, of resentment mm -hmm. that indigenous people have of other black folk. And also Europeans are masterful at the game of divide and conquer. Absolutely. So that's something. Let me tell one other quick story, quick story. Yes. yes. A good one. It doesn't have to be quick. Cool. Cool. No. Because <laughs> <laughs> we'll run out of time. My first trip to Australia, sure enough, I was able to come in 1998. They invited me and Tony Martin. And we were the keynoters along with the youngest sons of Stephen Biko at a big conference. And in the meantime, I was able to um, travel to other parts of Australia. And there's another, there was a couple associated with First World, Brother Barry and Sister Clara. I haven't talked to them in so long, but they actually gave me some money to help me with that trip. And I ended up going into the center of Australia, a place called Alice Springs, which is right in the center and a major population center. Now, I don't know how it was. I think the sister was organizing the conference, put the word out that this distinguished, no, no less, African-American professor was coming over there, sent us to a lot of communities and welcomed this brother. He's one of us, they more or less said. So I get to this place and one of the things that I was invited to see was a, a center for women who have been the victims of domestic violence, indigenous women, that's a big problem there. Mm -hmm. Domestic violence, big issue. And so I was brought there <clears throat> and these two elderly sisters came, kind of, I'm sure, trotted them out because white folks ran everything, right? Mm. And somehow they got these two elders to come and talk to me. And I asked them a lot of questions and I know they must have been saying, what is this damn fool keep asking us all these questions for? And it occurred to me, in fact, I asked them how old they were. They said, I don't know, that they've been kept under such control that some of them don't know when they were born. Okay. That's right. 
So I talked and talked and I said, let me shut my mouth. And it occurred to me that they didn't know much of anything about the history of African-Americans. So I decided to tell them a few things. I told them about ancient African kingdoms. And I told them about the Maafa, mm -hmm. told them about lynchings, mm -hmm. burnings of life. And they were getting, as I was saying, this very emotional. And one of them stopped me, put her hand up. And I'll never forget this. She said, do you want us to help you? Now, these women who had been so bruised and battered from a community that had been almost wiped out by the British, upon me telling the story of African-Americans and the atrocities we suffered, stopped with tears in our eyes and says, do you want us to help you? Oh, yeah, that's, wow. yeah. Mm -hmm. So. I tell you, that's African. It is. Our, yeah. And it's gotten us into so much trouble. Yeah. Because we've extended that courtesy all too often to people who took advantage of it. Yeah, who were not worthy of it. And yet, in spite of all of that, that sense of Ubuntu, of love, that we are one, still pervades Black humanity. All of two of humanness, that we are all human. And it's something that I guess you can't really put into words, but I experienced that a lot. And yeah. as a black man, it stands out even more. Yeah. 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 Well, we got this last about men business and women business. So what's like an example of women business versus men business? Well, if I told you, oh. hear me. They're very serious about that. Really? They don't even know. They will not even allow you to talk about it. Wow. You know, it's interesting. Some societies among indigenous Australians are have a kind of a matriarchal social structure. Okay. And others are very male dominant. Now in the Pacific Islands, it's very male dominant. And that's that's unusual to me because we talked about African identity and what it means to be black and African, et cetera. I think it's more than a phenotype. I think it's more than something physical. But June. Black folk, islands of the Pacific, like Fiji, for example, definitely patriarchal. And women better not get out of line. And I see some of that in Australia. Mm -hmm. mm. OK. All right, that's good to know. Oh, our technical issues today. Okay, all right. Maybe it's maybe it's the nor'easter. Oh, don't remind me of that storm, especially when you're sitting there in seventy degree weather. <laughs> yes, yeah, seventy. I'm ready to take this jacket off as we are. I think. <laughs> oh, I'm just it in. Yeah, I think my heater right here is on seventy. <laughs> oh wow! Well, good thing at least you have a heater. Okay. Yes, they. Oh yes, I, I take this heater with me everywhere. Everywhere I go, every room I sit in, I just put the little heater right there. Yeah, let's, I, let's, let's show some photographs. You want to yes, see some pictures? Yes. Let's see if we can do it. It's been a month since I've done this. Let's see. All right, we're going to share screen. Okay. And what else do we need to do? Um, uh, application window. Yeah, here we go. There you go. There you go. I should have come up. Let's try this one. Yeah. And, oh, why we and why? Yeah, oh, you got, there we go. Can you see it? Oh, you got a map! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Next time to make Brother Taki happy, I'm going to actually get a timeline. Promise it back to me. <laughs> yes, calculate his timelines. But you, you're making me happy with this map. This well, is good. Great. I love to make you happy. Now, this is a map of Australia. And Australia is not just a country, it's a continent. You know, I think it's the second smallest continent in the world. I think Antarctica is, is the smallest, and then Australia. And the name Australia means, um, I think it means great southern land. Austral has roots that mean southerly. And so here you are, here's a map. 
You hear, you see some of the indigenous nations and then the big states of Queensland. Queensland, you're talking about a racist place. Oh my God. Sisters and brothers in Queensland told me they call it KKK country. Oh, oh. And then south of Queensland is New South Wales. That's where Sydney is. And then south of there is the state of Victoria. Very, very beautiful. And the big city is Melbourne. That's where they play, for those who are interested, the uh, Australian Open tennis. I can't wait to see Os um, Naomi Osaka throw down. And then yeah, you have yeah. South Australia. All of these are former prison colonies. Let's keep that in mind, that the Europeans, the British who came to Australia uh, were there as a part of a penal settlement. And then you have Western Australia, vast. You have cities like, for example, Perth. And then you have this big chunk in the middle, and this is called the Northern Territory. I told you about those sisters, those elders, those women oh. here in the center, Alice Springs. And this is in this area, too, where you have the rock formation called Uluru. Europeans call it Ayers Rock. This is where the local people believe uh, this is the birthplace of creation and the navel of the universe. In fact, I think I have a photograph of it. But before we do that, here's Tasmania. There really is a place called Tasmania. Yeah. And it's right off the mainland. It's an island. This brother right Ooh. here is, yeah, you like that, huh? <laughs> Their way is probably the greatest of the resistance leaders. We can't just talk about oppression unless we talk about resistance to oppression. And Pimaway lived in the area around Botany Bay in Sydney, and he offered some of the fiercest resistance to the British invaders of his land. Oh. And then here's Renoko Rashi. Oh. And this is in front <laughs> I think I'm it's looking so cool. Anyway. <laughs> and this is yes. in front of Uluru. This is what I call the sacred magic mountain. And Europeans call this Ayers Rock. It's 1,100 feet long. And I don't know how high it is. And I was able to spend the night out there. And because wow. I was an honored wow. guest, I was given roasted kangaroo tail. Well, you know what? Someone asked about the roasted what? kangaroo tail. They want to know what, what it tastes like. It doesn't taste like chicken. Shall we just leave it at that? <laughs> Let's leave it at that. <laughs> That's another story. I'm telling you, we don't have time for that story. But at least I can say I tried it. Now, here's the interesting thing about this. This rock changes colors. Depending oh, on where wow. the sun is in the sky, it might be purplish or black or gray or bright red even. Here's just a sister in northern oh. Queensland. Yeah. Oh, so cute. Now, this oh. brother lives north of Australia, and he lives in a place called Bathurst Island. And he's from a group of people called the Tiwi, who say they are not like the indigenous Australians. And so what I'm saying is this entire vast area is just ripe for research about the history of our people there. That's a very distinguished looking elder. Yeah. yeah. And then of course we have Truganini. Now Truganini is the last of the full blood Tasmanians, Aboriginals. For years, I wrote that all of the Tasmanians have been wiped out. In fact, these are the kind of books that you see. These are the kind of books that I, um, would study. Uh, uh -huh. An admirer of mine way back in the 90s gave me a lot of rare books on Black people in the Philippines and Tasmania. And a lot of them have titles like The Last of the Tasmanians, The End of the Tasmanians, etc. At yeah. any rate, I wrote about that. And then I went to Australia and among the first people I met were Aboriginal Tasmanians. They said, Renoko, we like you, but as you can see, we are still here. What happened was Tasmania was established as a prison settlement colony in 1802, 1802, 1803. And <clears throat> she died in 1876. And she is the last full blood Tasmania. Tasmania was a place where the British sent the worst of their convicts. They sent the thieves and what have you to the mainland of Australia. But to Tasmania, off the coast of Australia, <clears throat> they sent the killers. They sent them, and they let loose their bloodlust on these sisters and brothers. Oh. And did horrific things to them. Horrific things. Mm. Cutting them alive, alive oh. castrating them. Okay. <laughs> okay. But what happened was, I found out when I got to Australia, 
and later on I went to Tasmania itself, that indigenous women, Aboriginal women were captured by the British, by British seal hunters and used as sexual slaves. And so the descendants of those sisters and brothers still exist in Tasmania. And I met with them and I, but for whatever reasons, I didn't take any pictures with them. I didn't want them to feel as though I was looking at them as a kind of a curiosity. Oh. I wish now I had, but that was a conscious decision not to photograph them. I didn't want them to make them to make them feel as though they were objects. Yeah. Anyway, this is Truganini, and she's the last full blood. And I will tell her story and the story of her husband in some detail Friday night. Here's another map. Now here's Australia, and these are the islands of the Pacific. In fact, most of this is Melanesia. Then you have the big island. I hope you can see the cursor of New Guinea. There's uh, Papua, West Papua, and then Papua New Guinea, and then New Zealand is down here. Here's Tasmania. Way over here is Fiji and Hawaii, et cetera. Just a couple more photographs. And this beautiful sister reminds me of you, Sister Felicia. She got her um, afro. Yeah, an afro. They have some nice, and believe it or not, I know this is going to be shocking. I used to have an afro many, many, many years ago. Yeah, I know it's, it's astonishing. You got to post a little pictures on Facebook. You got to post the afro picture. We want to see I'll afro. Probably, I'll yeah. probably put it on my Patreon page. I'll probably charge people to see it. But this is yes. a postcard that I picked up on my first trip to Fiji. Aww. And these sisters have these beautiful afros. And they say they come from Africa. They say they come from either Egypt or what they call Tanganyika. The east coast of Africa. Oh, I love it there. Fiji's paradise. Just a couple more. What else we got? Ah, and you have in the Pacific probably the first blondes. How many people would be astonished to know that black people, I believe without any doubt, are the first blondes and the first redheads because humanity comes from us and all of these things spring from us. Now, this is a little boy that I photographed on, I think my second or third trip to uh, Fiji, we're in Fiji now. And I'm leading a group and I'm on a tour bus and somebody says, uh, Dr. Rashidi, I gotta go to the bathroom. Okay, no problem. So we stop and find a, a place, a community where people can do what they gotta do. People got out, went to the bathroom. Some people got out and smoked cigarettes. Some people just got out and stretched their legs. I got out and had a beer because the group was wearing me out. So <laughs> here we are doing all of our thing. And all of us, this little blonde boy with two dark skinned parents come out, comes out of his house and they see us and we see them. And they say, where are you from? We said, we from Africa. And they said, we're from Africa. And sister, it was like a party. <laughs> this little boy comes out and everybody stops what they're doing. Put the beer can down, the cigarette out, come out the bathroom and gather around this little blonde boy. What's your name? You so cute. Here's some candy. Last thing he needed is a bunch, a mouthful of cavities. Can I give you a dollar? What they gonna do with a dollar in Fiji? Let me take a <laughs> photograph. Finally, the bus driver says, enough, we gotta go. So we all leave and get on the bus. And the youngest person in the group comes out, it'll never fail. The youngest person in the group comes out and says, Dr. Rashidi, what kind of message do we just send those people? And Sister Felicia, I really was stopped by that. To me, as an anthropologist, the child looks so different. But is that really what it is? Are we so enamored with whiteness or oh. lightness that it's instinctive, like Pavlov's dog in Russia, that we are drawn to light, bright, damn near white. And it's so deeply embedded in our psyche that we don't even, in sense, almost instinctive. Now, I'm not saying that's the case, but I really, really maybe travel is so wonderful in that it's an education and you learn so much. Absolutely. And a lot of what you learn about is yourself. It's as though you are looking at yourself in a mirror and you don't always like what you see. It's a little brother in Fiji. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, food for thought. This is the flag of Vanuatu. I found it interesting that it's red, black, and green. They got some gold in there for variety. And then this is Kamehameha the Great. This is the king of Hawaii who came very close to unifying the Hawaiian Islands. 
a big man, like seven feet tall, and clearly a black man by my standards of race and ethnicity. And according to one tradition, when he was trying to unify the Hawaiian Islands, he ran into trouble and he sent back to Africa for reinforcements. That's what a native Hawaiian told me. Wow. And then of course, with Dr. Ben, I oh. love the, the ancestors, the elders, and I get a lot of credit and recognition because of Zoom and social media and Facebook, but we stand on the shoulders of giants. Absolutely. And this is my favorite picture with Dr. Ben, who I say was a real pioneer in terms of examining the African presence in the Pacific. And for those of you all who wanna spend some money and get a good book at the same time, <laughs> where there's a section that deals with the black presence in Australia and the Pacific, it's my only book for children, Asada Garvey and Me, A Global African Journey for Children. And you can order that, go to my website and Sister Felicia, that's all yep. for your ass. Oh, that's nothing. That's, that's like, oh my God. See, okay, listen, everybody. What are you, what are you talking about? You got it. You, everyone, everyone feels the same way I did. It was like, that was literally a teaser. So just go on to, um, you just go to Eventbrite and just put in Renoco. Trust me, he's That's the it. only Renoco out it. there. You get your ticket for this evening. I mean, I, I'm sorry, for this week. Friday night from 8 to 9.30 is the first session. And then the next morning at 11, 11 o'clock or 11.30? 11.30. 11, 11.30. Eastern time. Eastern Standard Time. And let me tell you, you are, it's like, as soon as you, as soon as he starts and he's prompt, let me tell everybody that too. Don't think you can roll in and like, you know, 815, you're going to miss like a hundred pictures. So you got to get there in the beginning because it, it's structured so nice. Um, he invites an ancestor to, um, you know, take us on this journey along with him. It's just, it's just such a beautiful um uh, uh, just a beautiful seminar. You guys have got to take advantage of this. So go to Eventbrite, hit just Renoco. You'll see it. Get your ticket and get somebody else a ticket. These tickets are very affordable. Okay. Um, you know, this is the time. This is actually really good for um, for uh, for Christmas if you celebrate, Kwanzaa if you celebrate. Um, you know, this is a good time to you know, to purchase these tickets. It's going to be great. It's this Friday again from 8 to 9.30 and Saturday from um, 11 to 12, I'm excuse me, 11.30 to 12.30. Does anybody have any questions? Because I see there's like a lot of, um, you guys have been kind of chiming in. We've all been chiming, chiming in as he's talking. Does anyone have you questions? Know, the, the reason I put my, uh, the mute on the mic it's because I had closed the door. The trash man came. So I had to close the door because of no noise. And it's so hot. I started to perspire. Oh, okay. I, couldn't, I couldn't help but tell you that. It's so <laughs> hot. I started to perspire. So I had to open the door. That's like the third time you made a, a little shady joke. You know what? And the ironic <laughs> thing is, I like cold weather. Wintertime is my favorite time of year. Maybe because I grew up in Southern California mm. and the weather is so mild, it's going to drop to 46 degrees tonight. And that's on the news. People are talking about how cold, <laughs> how cold it's going to be. All right. I'll yeah. leave it at that. That's cool. <laughs> um, all right. So we're going to, um, everybody's going to come check you out. And if you have not seen a Renoco um, webinar, I don't know what you're doing because each one is fabulous. And the thing about it, you have a Patreon page. So if you sign up to the Patreon page, you can actually get a free ticket for the seminar um, for, you know, for that month. You just have to reach out to, um, to uh, Dr. Rashidi's handler because you, know, you gotta have a handler to take care of wow, these Wow, a handler, my goodness. I didn't <laughs> yes. realize I had such a lofty stature in the world. Yes, and plus there's a lot of other good stuff. And he always emails like really beautiful pictures. So you gotta you know, check him out on Patreon. Yeah. Um, so um, some of the stuff you kind of um, touched about, but uh, you know, you touched on, but in terms of like the status, like what is the uh, status of the um, brothers and sisters? I defy anybody to tell me a place in the world where black people exist or black people are not on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Can anybody? What is it about us that no matter where we find ourselves? So that answers your question. Yeah. about Australia and the Pacific Islands. In Australia, black people are in 
terrible condition. I'm talking about the indigenous Australians. They are what one of my colleagues, a sister named Graceland Smallwood from Australia refers to as a fourth world nation, not third world, but fourth world. And then we've already talked about West Papua, Irian Jaya, where black folk are fighting for independence. God bless them. And then in the rest of the Pacific Islands, they, they're really not very powerful. These are small islands, not long ago uh, colonies, and they don't exert a lot of power. Now in New Caledonia, the indigenous people are called Kanaks, K-A-N-A-K-S. And there was just a referendum. New Caledonia is a French colony. And there was a referendum just within the last few months about whether it should be independent. And the Kanaks now are a minority in their own country. And so the majority French population there voted to re retain their links with France. And so there's an independent struggle there. And all over the Pacific, it's, it's, it's a struggle. I see Dr. James Small there. Good to hear from him. One of our wisest men. Mm -hmm. Great scholar and a great brother. Yes, yes. He speaks highly of him. That's the thing. Well, that's I, the I speak thing. highly of him. Yeah, I think that's the other piece that people don't realize is that you guys are just like a bunch of just love fest people. You guys not all, all of us. Each other. Not all of us. Some of us can't stand each other, as a matter of fact. Let's be <laughs> real. But I don't know. But you guys mask it very well because I tell you, everyone like we'll talk to somebody like, oh, Renoko, da 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 da, -da. oh, <laughs> Professor Small, da 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 da. -da. So I haven't met the person who don't like nobody yet. I guess I may well, have that person yet. Well, good. All good, you guys good, good, good. are all, you know. Our, our maybe, maybe because some of us are able to see the big picture and we see that this is beyond our ego and this is beyond, you know, me. One of our brothers, uh, Tony Browder, brother Kyrock, is in Kemet right now. Yeah. Talking yes. about the new things they found in the 25th dynasty. You had Robin Walker on a couple of weeks ago, one of my favorite people. Yeah. You know, so yeah, there's a lot of work to be done and there's enough work for everybody. And I think it's also very important that we encourage the sisters. We live in a field that I think is dominated by brothers. I think that African women have something special and unique to offer, and that needs to be encouraged. And I think they need to hear that from black men themselves, strong black men with powerful voices. And Dr. James Small is one of those brothers. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know what? And let me just tell you, out there, y'all need to go into um, Dr. Rashidi's uh, Facebook page, Rashidi, uh, uh, Renoko Rashidi, and he gives Black sisters love every single day. If it's not a flower, it's a beautiful picture of, of some beautiful um, Black deity. Like, it's always something good. So that's just a little side note. We're going to get back to these questions, but I'm just telling y'all, y'all need to check out Dr. Renoko Rashidi. But, but we're, we're all, we all we got. We, we all don't have but each other. Exactly. Sometimes people say, and I get annoyed by it, they say, Renoko, what should we do? What's the plan? To me, plans are a dime a dozen. It's the execution of the plan that's hard. Spend more money with each other. Black men need to be with a black woman. Stop telling me you couldn't help who you fell in love with. And join an organization of like-minded people. Take down that image of God that doesn't look like you off your wall. Get more involved with some basic things. See, that's the hard part. And I think some of us are able to see the big picture and we're some, able to submerge our individual egos because there's enough for everybody. One of the reasons I'm not jealous of the other scholars is because there's enough room in the scholarship in terms of reconstructing here for everybody. You ain't got to be petty about it. That's enough for everybody. And let me tell and you, me you tell guys you are the hardest working people right now. It, you guys are the constantly working because it's not only, you know, you're just not working like on East Coast time. You're doing West Coast stuff and then you're doing Africa stuff, but it's like all on Zoom. And I'm like, you guys have a serious calendar going and, on. And why is, why is that? Because we love what we do. Yes. It's, yes. it's work, but it's a labor of love. I love what I do. When I wake up in the morning, I start my researches all during the day. I thrive on intellectual stimulation. I'm always compiling information, editing photographs. And I do that until I go to bed at night. And sometimes I even dream about it because I love it. See, yeah. we're doing something that, that is uplifting our people, we hope. 
but we're also doing something that we genuinely enjoy. It's almost like a hobby. Yeah. You know, I love what I do. And right now what I'm doing is archiving these photographs and, and sharing them. My major focus is the museum photos, but also like what I'm gonna do this weekend, I'm gonna show the people themselves. So I have, I don't know, maybe a half a million of these photos from the museums, from the tombs, from the temples, and actually black communities. And this weekend, I'm gonna show photographs that I've never shown in public before. I'm gonna show you black people from East New Britain and Bougainville and Vanuatu and the Solomon Islands and New Caledonia. I hope to introduce you to a whole nother part of the African world. Let me say this one last thing because it's such an honor to be with them. I used to, there's an organization called ASCAC. And in the yeah, early days, yeah. we had a number of conferences in Southern California. And I think we had one at Compton College. And this was perhaps the first time I was given a plenary. Dr. Jeffries was the plenary speaker. And I think he introduced me or said something about me. And he said something I'll never forget. He says, and something to the fair, Renoko Rashidi is introducing us to whole new worlds. Mm. And of all the things anybody's ever said about me, that's one of the ones that means the most. That there's a whole new world of African people. And it's exciting to be living in a time, a new age of discovery. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we can feel the love that you have for what you do. We can feel it because this is everything that you do. That's what's up. So, you know, speaking of that, um, in terms of just research and stuff um, like that, it, are there like researchers um, like, in, like from these actual populations that are doing this work? <clears throat> I have um, some contacts in Australia with some members of the Aboriginal Australian Black Panther Party. Do you know that there was a Garvey movement in Australia in the 1930s? And in 1970, and Jack Johnson went to Australia and met with the Aboriginal people when he, on one of his big boxing matches. And in 1975, there was a Black Panther Party established in Australia. Well, I have contacts with them and some young scholars there too, who are, who are just doing some remarkable work. They're also Pan-Africanists, and they're talking about these various links historically. But in terms of the Pacific Islands, no, I have a lot of friends on Facebook who are from the Pacific Islands, but nobody that I'm aware of is really doing any serious scholarly research from a Pan-Africanist perspective. For me, if I were to do something like that, it would be like the jewel in the crown. I've looked at the African presence in Asia, so many parts of the world, but with the South Pacific and Australia, I think somebody else is going to need to do that. So I'm running out of time. I still have a lot of juice in the tank, but that's a, a serious work. So I'm hoping that somebody listening right now or watching right now will be inspired to say, that's what I want to do. The old man with a white beard named Renoko Rashidi, I saw him on TV one night and he said, somebody need to research the South Pacific. And I decided that's what I was going to do. And I owe Dr. Rashidi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what's yeah. up. Yeah, yeah you know, that's what's up. Yeah, I saw your, your buddy Kofi, he's up on here. Uh, he was chiming in as well. And I know that that's one of your um, your good friends, Kofi. I saw Kofi. Yeah, I can, I can Kofi with the Kofi. hair. Not yeah. only a good friend, but a student. Kofi is doing work in the black communities of Southeast Asia, like in Malaysia. So my brother Kofi Kepra is doing tremendous work. And I'd love to call him a friend. And also, since he's younger than me, a student. Take that, Kofi. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, all right, let's see. So, um, so you you talked about this briefly in terms of like the the history of resistance. Yeah. Okay. So, um, can so actually, can you just talk a little bit more about like you know was there and uh, um, or what is the history of resistance in Australia? Yeah, big, big time. Um, I want to see ourselves as more than victims. We don't want to minimize the suffering of our ancestors, but we did more than suffer. Whether it be on a, in the antebellum South or whatever the case may be, we did more than suffer. We fought back. And Australia is no exception to that. You have a number of, of wars that the indigenous Australians waged against the British settlers. Unfortunately, 
they didn't have the firepower to match up with those Europeans. And I'll tell you something else that we can learn from their struggle. Initially, apparently they didn't see themselves as one people. They saw themselves as tribes or nations. Europeans just exploited one group against the other. For example, they might use one group of sisters and brothers as trackers so they could trace the resistance fighters in the desert or wherever they were. And then after the British were finished with them, they just discarded them. So while we may not see ourselves as a monolithic group, Europeans have been able to exploit that. And so over a period of time, black folk almost, you know, were reduced to like one to 2% of the population in Australia. By the 1860s, black people with the rise of social Darwinism were seen in Australia as like a, a doomed race, a breed destined to, uh, to cease to exist. So there is a resistance, but we don't have a clear record of it. Now in the, 19, in the, in the 20th century, you have freedom rights, yeah, freedom rights. You had the Black Panther Party. You had a Garvey movement. But we also need to keep in mind that Black folk in Australia are only about 2% of the total population. So they are a very, very small minority in their own country. And Australia is really a racist country, big oh. time. Some of the farmers from Zimbabwe, when Robert Mugabe was on the case, and when apartheid was coming to an end in South Africa, they moved to Australia because of the racist environment there. <clears throat> and so there was resistance. In fact, I'll talk a lot more about that Friday night. There's some good books on the subject on resistance to Australia. In <clears throat> Melanesia, the greatest form of resistance, and we need to be aware of it, is the struggle for independence in West Papua. The leader there is a brother named Benny Winda. Benny Winda is head of the Paramount Chief of the Dani people. Dr. Jeffries will remember him in Dakar, Senegal in 2010 at the Big Fest Man Conference. His brother coming from West Papua, New Guinea and meeting with President Abdullah Wad, the president of Senegal, it was a big deal. Anyway, he's the leader of the resistance movement in West Papua. And I'm convinced if they don't kill him that he will be the head of state of the newly independent uh, nation of West Papua. And that struggle is unrelenting, it's vicious, it's brutal. And at least we need to know about it. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's my next question. <laughs> I was going to ask you about the, you know, what was going on about the struggle there. One West thing that, that I think African Americans can do is we can bring the attention of the world to these various struggles. Yeah. And that's ironic to me that the descendants of people taken out of the door of no return are now in such a pivotal position to mold and shape the future of the entire African world. Like, I think that we played a role in the demise of apartheid in South Africa. We put pressure on the US government, we put pressure on uh, international companies to divest. I think that we can have that same influence with black liberation struggles in other parts of the world. Here's something else. We should never separate our struggle with the struggles of black people in other parts of the world. In other words, our struggle is not just in Harlem and Bronx and Staten Island and Queens, okay, and Brooklyn. It's not just in Los Angeles. It's not just in the United States. It's a global struggle. Absolutely. Last vestiges of white domination, white imperialism, white supremacy, racism, whatever you want to call it. We should never separate those struggles. Yeah. You know that during the 1950s and 60s, we would have our own civil rights movement and black power movement. Sisters and brothers were having a very similar struggle in Africa itself. So we should never separate those struggles. We are a global people. And that is so important. We are a global people. Global people. Global people. And I think that we need to see the big picture. You know who saw the big picture? Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King carefully monitored the African liberation struggle. Martin Luther King went to Africa on March 6, 1957, when Ghana became independent, independent, there's a picture with him and Osage for Kwame Nkrumah. King went, to, now we know this about Malcolm, but King went to Africa several times. Martin Luther King went to Jamaica and talked about Marcus Mosiah Garvey as one of the greatest men we've ever produced, but we never hear that about them. 
And that's because we don't control our own narratives. Yeah. We yeah. don't tell our own stories for the most part. And happy talks, happy movement is facilitating that. So you yeah, know what? what you all are doing is wonderful. I'm glad to be a part of it. Yeah, you know, yeah. I'm going to do that. So we can be some more happy talks because there's is so much for us to cover. It's not impossible, though. You know, a lot of times, you know, we're looking at this whole big, you know, um, just, just, you know, especially when you're talking about like this, uh, you know, you're saying that there's no place that we can find black people not oppressed. And, Tell me a place. Tell yeah, me a place. Name one. Yeah. I mean, that can be overwhelming, but literally, if everyone just, just did something, yeah. just did something, like it can it can change. It can literally change. Um, wow. Okay. You you know what? You you've actually answered a lot of my questions. Um I'm good. <laughs> yes. So I did a good job. Mm -hmm. You did an you know, you did an excellent job. You did an excellent job. So now, now, where are you going to take us? Um, you know, after this webinar, where's the what? What African presence are you going to take us next? And what global African presence are we going to? You mean this weekend or next month when we do another well, happy talks? No, yeah, yeah, next month. Next month, I'm going to return to the Nile Valley. You know, I'm going to begin to do maybe like three months worth of work oh. on the Nile mm -hmm. Valley. Now I have about, oh my, my intention in the course of about three months is to show 1,200 original photographs, mostly from museums, but also the tombs and temples and monuments from the pre-dynastic period all the way to the Coptic period in Nile Valley history. All the dynasties, you know, Mayro, Napata, Taseti, Kerma, the Balana, all of that, all mm -hmm. with them pictures from the valley of the now you can't get away from the valley of the happy valley sorry <laughs> from it too long it's always the source it's always the root i don't think we talk about kemet and and nubia too much i think that we need to make a do a better job of connecting it with the rest of africa and the african world and that's what you all are doing so we are definitely on the same page yeah I'll absolutely I'm going to begin to promote my tours next year. I'm going to take a group to Kemet beginning August 1st. But before that, I'm going to take a group to Ghana. Oh. Jefferson, a small country to Ghana. I was just asked, I was uh, placed, how do I say it? I was named to the curatorial board of a new museum in Africa. It's the Pan-African Heritage World Museum, I think it's called. And I've been named to the, the curatorial board. And I intend to have a lot to say about what's put on display. And one of the things that I want to display, I want to have my photographs. I'm getting up in years. I'm an elder myself now. I have to face that. And we have to talk about, for me, what's going to happen to my artifacts, my photographs, all the, the books and what have you. And yeah. this is like a dream come true. So. Next wow. month, I'm a promotion to Ghana and to Egypt. The new museum in Egypt should be open by then, the new Egyptian museum. Yeah. They have the tomb chamber of Saqqara. Wow. So this is the tomb chamber. This is the step pyramid that was designed by Imhotep, whose tomb has never been found, by the way. But now the tomb chamber of the step pyramid for King um, Zoser, or Joser is open. So I'm looking forward to going back to, to the to Africa. I'm hoping that with as the virus begins to settle down, the vaccination, whatever takes place, that people will be hungry to travel. Isn't it interesting that last year, the the year of return, or you know, they were having all this promotional stuff about coming to Africa. West African tourism, tourism in particular, was at its height. It was booming, and the Ooh. pandemic, you know, desic, um, decimated that. So I'm looking forward to going back to Africa. Yeah, yeah. yes, <laughs> me too. We, I was supposed to be in uh, Egypt. We had a tour planned um, at the end of September and first week in um, in October and just, yeah. I tell well, you, Egypt, Egypt has been there for a long time and I yes. suspect Egypt will be there in 2021 when we go, yeah. It better be, yes, it better be, it better be. Um, so everyone, listen, please like and share this video. 
because it's very important that we get the, um, you know, just get the news out about Dr. Rashidi and Happy Talks. And, uh, you know, these, the new currency now are these likes and, and subscribing. Like that's the new currency now. So it's very important that you guys support us on all our different platforms. We're on Twitter, uh, Instagram, and Facebook. And also go to happyfilm.com and get your, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff you can do there, okay? You can get your ticket for our screening that will be on December 26th, first day of Kwanzaa. You can also sign up for the newsletter. And, you know, we, and, and, and other pieces that we always send some other things out besides the newsletter that you kind of get, um, you know, you get, you get the inside scoop before anybody else does. Like we, you know, we send out some about you, Dr. Rashidi, you know. Um, oh, really? But, yeah, is it but, good? Is it good or bad? No, what you send out? It's always good. Are you, you know? sure? Yep. Yep. <laughs> it's always good. Letting people know, like, listen, come on, you got to get, you got to get to the seminar. Um, and also it's, you know, it's important because it costs money to do all the things that we're doing and the, and the things that Dr. Rashidi is doing. So if you are on YouTube, please feel free to use the super chat. Um, and, uh, you know, and just put a little money in Hoppy's pocket so we can get some of these, you know, things done because we got a lot to do. So let me just make sure, let me just get all, let, let me just organize this for everybody and myself. We're going to go to Hoppy Film. We're going to do a couple of things tonight. We're going to, everybody going to go to hoppyfilm.com. And if you are not a subscriber to the newsletter, just hit the little button, put your information in so you can get, um, get you know, so you can get on the list. If you have not seen Hoppy, I don't know how you haven't seen Hoppy. Some people don't even know that we have a documentary. There's a full length documentary. It's two hours and 12 minutes. Go and get a ticket because the, the, the cool thing about the ticket is that afterwards we have a panel discussion only for ticket holders. Uh, you know, and, and sometimes it includes people who are not cast members, but a lot of times it's the Hoppy cast members and um, they just talk about different things and we don't even know where it's going to go we don't film it you have to be in the house to be able to see it so you know make sure if you haven't seen hoppy december 26th first day at kwanzaa get your ticket but if you don't want to wait and you're like you know i need to see this like tonight as soon as we're done with happy talks you can actually go and um we have a it, it's on vimeo and you can still go to hoppyfilm.com and hit merchandise and there's a button takes you right to vimeo and you can get a, a digital download or you can stream it other pieces that we have lots of merchandise um, get just buy something, <laughs> and if you don't buy something for yourself, you can buy it for somebody else. Um, so those are all things you're going to do. Now, the other thing that you're going to also do is that you are going to go to uh Eventbrite and just put in Renoco, just put in Renoco because he's the only Renoco. I love that name. What does Renoco mean? You know what it means? It means handsome, that's what it means. Okay, all right, <laughs> there it is. You are handsome. I want to see this picture of this now you have me. Now you have me blushing, okay? <laughs> yeah. Renoko <laughs> is a Shona name. Shona is from Zimbabwe. Oh. And somebody gave me that name. I didn't give myself that name. So anyway, since you brought it up, there you have it. Yeah. Okay. You know what? That's what I, see, so someone looked at you and was like, you know what? You are Renoko. All right, can we go on? Let's promote the webinar. Let's promote the webinar. Yes. <laughs> you know what? I've noticed every time I give you a compliment, you always try to push me along to something. Because I'm shy and I'm bashful. I'm just a humble, hardworking yeah, African historian who loves black folk. That's all. You've, mm -hmm. you've been to 135 countries. You can't be that 125. Shy. We need to oh, be active. Yeah, Still, but I've I, always. Yeah, 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 yeah. Felicia, I'm come on. You. Yeah, All I don't right, know. That's, that's, you one good shy person. So, so anyway, everybody. <laughs> webinar. 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 Friday, Webinar. Saturday. Friday. Friday yes. and Saturday. This Friday and Saturday. So you can see it and you're not, it's not going to mess up with any type of holiday plans you have. And it's so good. You know, we did the one last uh, month and I had um, all my kids and my godson sitting up looking at it. They were excited. They actually dressed up to watch <laughs> Renoko. They were so happy to see Dr. Renoko Rashidi. So please, you know, go Eventbrite, put in Renoko, get your tickets. Um, there you go. And yeah, I think that's it. I, th I think I think that's it. You well, have any closing remarks? Sister, I've uh, enjoyed tonight immensely. I think everybody can see that I was in a good mood. I was relaxed. Yes. I feel yes. good about us as a people. We are living in challenging times. Yeah. But I know the strength and resilience of our people. 
Yes. And I'm confident that we're going to prevail. As long as we have people like you, the elders, the young people who are taking, you know, that old African proverb goes, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So let's go together. So thank you for having me. Happy New Year, Kwanzaa, Christmas, for whatever y'all celebrate. I don't judge you by your religion. I base you on what you do. Mm. So let's be about uplifting our community. So thank you, my sister. All right, and I'll see you this weekend. See you this weekend. All right. Peace, family. I don't know what we can talk about in this nation without talking about white superiority, honestly. Who defines the meaning of God also defines the relationship between economy and God. African Americans spent $1.3 trillion last year, making us the 16th wealthiest nation in the world. Why have we not turned those riches into wealth to develop our community?